two, one. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Failure Friday, where we talk to friends, clients, and sometimes complete strangers about how failure has shaped who they are and gotten them to the next level, or maybe they're still struggling, but the purpose of it is to help their brands and hopefully help at least one viewer who might be in the same steps or approaching the same type of issues in their life. And today, we do not have a stranger. We have A.G. Williams. Sometimes I just call him Antoine because I don't know which one he prefers, and I just you know, I toggle. Depends on my mood. Has nothing to do with him. Uh, I co-authored a book with him. He let me come into his life and just kind of expand upon his experience, his childhood. And I'm sure we'll touch on that briefly. That's one of my greatest accomplishments this far. We just released uh, the workbook that goes with our first book, and we are working, could be working a lot faster on the second book, and I blame a lot of that on me. But this isn't about me and my failures today. This is about AD's fuck-ups. So let's focus on him. (laughs) AD is, of course, an author. He is in healthcare administration and, most importantly, a community leader. And uh, why don't you expand on that? Because you're so much more than those three titles. Absolutely. Well, I'm just happy to hear that I'm no longer a stranger. A lot has transpired since... uh, Instagram messages searching for an illustrator back in 2000, yeah, 2016, 2017. So Mance is, uh, is the books, you know, Mance's little reminders is to the world about two years old, but to us, it's been about six years. So that is- We took the yeah, long way with that shit. Yeah. We took the so scenic to route. You. I know, exactly. We took the, yeah. The route of no beyond. I reached out to you about pictures, and at the time you were doing your thing on Instagram, and you know now we're co-authoring uh, a series. So, with that being said, Mansa's little reminders: the Money Workbook comes out this Friday on April Fool's Day, but it is no joke. We're kicking no off financial, joke. yeah, kicking off financial literacy month with um, the gift that keeps on giving plenty of tips around savings, budgeting, investing, active fun exercises for kids with the goal being that one resource at a time, one child at a time, we will chip away at the financial wealth gap and we will just normalize conversations around money, um, around tables and classrooms everywhere. So I'm happy to be here for sure. So important. So proud of of where we're going, where we've come from and the journey, it's been a beautiful journey. I mean, I wish Taylor was on here with us to, to expand on his portion and he's been here with us for a while too. When did we bring right. Taylor in? Jeez Louise, probably in 2018. Was it 18? Yeah, 2018. I was gonna say 19. Yeah, yeah. Taylor in 2018. He's, been, he's been a value add. He's been a value add too. I really appreciate him. Yeah, he's read but, a few more books and illustrated a few more Has books. he? So yeah, yeah, about two more. So yeah, oh my uh, gosh, we, can take credit. we can take credit for that. We can take credit for that. Yeah, we put them on the map. Exactly. <laughs> that for sure. So tell us about the career. And so that's that's our, what's the saying? Like we work on our weekend to create the, the life that we want to have in five, 10 years. But you have mm-hmm. also a job that you work during the day, just like me, you're nine to five, which is yeah. your pay my bills, not pay my Absolutely. dreams life. Tell us about that career path and how you got into it. Yeah, so healthcare, healthcare administration, as you mentioned. So now I range from Detroit, Michigan. So I'm a Florida boy. So I'm a fish out of water. I am a fish out of sunshine. And I am. He's in, in a turtleneck. <laughs> yeah, I'm in a turtleneck because then that is symbolizing the weather, right? It's spring, but it's very much so still winter here. It's been uh, bouncing between. 25 degrees uh, to a high of 52 degrees. So on any given day, you could be starting the day in a turtleneck and ending in a uh, uh, a long sleeve shirt. But I haven't. Did been you have to? Yet. Did you have to get a whole new wardrobe? Like, did you have to Google what Detroitian would wear? Absolutely. Yeah. So I lived in Pennsylvania for a little bit, which we'll talk about wow. in regards to transitioning healthcare. But I did. I did. I did Pennsylvania wrong. I had Florida edition jackets, a Florida edition car. I didn't have all wheel drive. So we're uh, we're living and learning from our failures. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's so, a, that's difference. 
Yeah. So healthcare administration right now serving as a vice president of operations at a large hospital, a part of a large health system here in Detroit. It's been a um, really a long time coming, but I'm still on the, some would say the early portion of my career. So I've just been blessed to be a part of great teams, work with great leaders and uh, develop some, some positive things that has kind of leveraged my expertise. And now I'm serving in a, a leadership role or for person leadership team for a um, 340 bed hospital with the number of locations. So it's a, a heavy lift, but supported by great people here. And um, yeah, looking forward to the challenge. This is month four, so we're still going. So when you say leadership, is that equivalent to management role? And is this your first leadership role? No, so this is probably my fourth leadership role. So now I'm officially in the C-suite. So now I'm a a leader of leaders, as they say. So I have a a number, um, seven plus managers and directors that that report to other administrators and those administrators report to me. So I have hundreds and hundreds of team members that um, somehow, some way responsible for it, which is uh, uh, with great, great responsibility. Um, come great, comes great power, or however the saying go. Have you always felt like you were a leader? Did you gravita- gravitate towards leadership roles? I think so, by by choice, right? So I'm the oldest of ten siblings, so, so no children on my own yet, but the oldest of ten. So I would like to think that that makes you mature a little quicker. And you know, if you want to be a respected big brother. Um, you gotta hold some things down. So I think that I've been I've been wearing that on my uh, sleeve for a long time. So you're the oldest of ten. This is not news to me. But how many of those are sisters, and how many of those are brothers, and how does your role change dependent on the gender? Seven brothers, two sisters. I would say oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, dynamics have changed. I've learned so much from them. You know, one means of communication, one strategy or tactic to get something across changes nine different times. And it changes probably two more times going from male to female. Um, I've been more open and empathetic because of my, my sisters. And I've been um, forced to be more strategic as I think, uh, as I think about my brothers and getting messages across to them. And I would like to say that it's a 50-50 success rate either way, but they're holding it down and they're representing well thus far. But I feel like there's also, not only are you the oldest, but isn't there a pretty big age gap as well? I mean, there has to be, there's nine. Yeah, ironically enough, my brother just posted on social media, like one of those, how tall are you? How old are you? And and the fourth one under me is 27 now. So folks, they're getting old. I feel like once you get to 30, it just starts catching up. But the youngest, my brother Devin is eight. So that is where the big swing (laughs) comes in at, yeah. (laughs) That is, yeah. But you'd never even lived with Devin because he's so much Uh -uh. younger. No, he's visited and came up and all that good stuff. But yeah, no, we're, uh, he could be my son. <laughs> you can put his car seat in your car. Like that's how much older you were. Yeah, right. He would laugh at, he would, he would correct you. He's a genius. He would correct you if you say anything about the car seat. He would remind you that he's eight years what? old. What? <laughs> that's hysterical. But why healthcare? So healthcare came on the heels of a failure. Um, first generation college student. Um, you know, play athletics in, in high school was all intentions on going to a one AA school in either LaGrange, Georgia or Iona in New upstate New York to play football. And, you know, something came upon me. I talked to the one individual I knew that had successfully graduated. It's my godbrother. He lived around the corner from my grandma. We sat down. He told me to apply to Florida State. He knew someone that knew someone in the summer program. And That led to me applying and said, you know what, you know, I got a decent GPA. I'm a pretty smart guy. Let's go to Florida State. He said, you're smart. You're good in math and science. Do not study business, study engineering because engineers make money. Um, And that worked out well for about a year and a half, two years. And then I got to trig to physics to calc to all at once and, and those classes jumped me and kicked my all ass. All at once. And all at once. It was, you know, rough. And it, it, it happens all at once when you 
fail one, pass one, and then you gotta mm -hmm. take some during the summer. So it was just a, uh, it was physics two and calc two. I had finally passed trig on the second time with the C. So it just got to the point where the coursework was interesting in the e-school as we call it, but the prereqs um, were testing my, my dedication. So uh, I made the switch. I got an internship at Target. Um, I had worked retail as a high school student, got an internship at Target, barely, barely slipped into the College of Business at Florida State. I had to pass managerial accounting. Oh, I remember that. Sudana Holly, I'll never forget her name. When I say she gave me a C, I know for a fact. <laughs> I probably had a, now mind you, I probably had a 69, but she gave me a C and it's because I was genuine i was meeting with her and she saw a real effort but that c got me into business school and um those failures are are why i'm in the position that i'm in now and still still pushing i'm day. gonna stop you right there because you just reminded me of something so important i remember having this thought in college like people need to know this if you go to a teacher's office hours and you get to know them outside of them being just a teacher but as a person they will for the most part show you grace in situations situations like this like the first class that ever made me had a panic attack and cry was organic chemistry and i was in that man's office every single day after class and i swear to god same situation i should not have passed that class and the only reason i passed is because he was like oh shit i know this girl's a person now i can't let her fail yeah. like, let me just give her so that that's important people like if you show up and you humanize yourself and you humanize the teacher the odds are in your favor but go on that's a spot on touch on that you are a real human you're not a number especially at a big school like, like florida state so that was oh, yeah. i was i was one of a handful that actually showed up to her office hours and that that relationship paid off and Every time I tell this story, it's a reminder to find her on LinkedIn or email and just shoot her a note and just randomly say, Thank Have you? you? Oh, Have yeah. You? Over, the, over the years, probably once every four years, I tell oh, this story. That's so and cool. I, you know, yeah. So I will after this for sure. Does she answer you or she just goes to you? Like, yeah, I think if I search my email, I think I got an email dating back to 2014, 2015. But she acknowledges you. You're not just like, the loser emailing your old no like, no no you. she sees she sees the glow up on linkedin and i'm, I'm sure uh, you know she's helped many more students because of you know me being me pushing forward and making her look good <laughs> so she was a good teacher yeah she was good she was good and even so if then, she wasn't good she was good <laughs> she was yeah even if she wasn't good she was great because what if she sees this so that which which class specifically brought you to your knees and was like this is I gotta I gotta pivot. So it was physics two for sure. I vividly remember physics two over the summer. Um, I was actively interviewing through an organization called Inroads. So if you're a student, if you have students, especially if they're minority, have them look up Inroads, amazing program. Just some amazing people that just plugged me into these opportunities over the years. So inroads, and ironically enough, I was interviewing for engineering roles, so CAT, um, et cetera, Exxon, et cetera, et cetera. And I also just threw my name in the hat to interview for Target. So it's almost like the universe and God was talking to me. So physics two brought me to my knees. That same week, I got um, the offer for the target internship you know i felt like i was going to be rich it was paying like 16 dollars an hour or something or something that's it was good for insane. a college student yeah it was crazy it was like 16 and then like we were leader on duty it goes up to like 19 or 20 and this was i'm not old wow. this was like or you know late 2000 so it was it was crazy no, so that's good i um at that week the following week i went to college of business to see what it would take to switch my major they gave me the list of requirements and one of them was you have one semester to pass all your classes which which i did well and manager your accounting was the uh the buzzer beater i did not like that class i think yeah. they had a lot to do with the teacher and i'm not going to say their name but i will remember them to the day i die and not <laughs> for sure for sure like a good teacher will make it make or break a shitty class Mm -hmm. So you made the pivot. What aspect of that? 
because people switch their majors all the time and they don't feel like a failure. What aspect of that made you feel like a failure? Like dive a little bit more deep into the emotional side of it. Like why were you so, it doesn't seem like you were so married to the engineering part if it was just your god brother sitting down at a table and being like, you should do this, it makes money. Was it deeper yeah, than that? You're, yeah, absolutely. When you're known, you know, especially you know, growing up, you know, how I grew up, it was, you know, one or two things, you know, either you know, be a, a athlete, like really an athlete. So constant questions around when are you walking on the Florida State? Of course, from like family members that don't really understand that the success rate there is like one to a thousand. You know what I mean? So it's like when are yeah, you like is it Florida worth it? State? Yeah, when are you playing, etc. So all of those things were going on my so that was already like damn it, like I'm letting folks down by not continuing, you know, the, the football career. So the win was, you know what, I'm really gonna shock the world and graduate and make all this money as an engineer and, you know, prove that not only am I smart, but I'm like of the smartest, right? So when you think about it's doctors and engineers, you know, that was doctors, engineers, and athletes. So if I wasn't gonna do the athletic route, it was, I'm gonna be an engineer. Um, I had already told my family that it was that's what I was studying. So I was at not only at Florida State as a first generation college student, but I was at Florida State studying to be an engineer. Um, so for me to be sitting there in physics too, like damn, like not only do I not really care about this, but it's kicking my ass. It was it was really you know disheartening and sad to come again and be able to you know have to say that damn, like I'm, I'm switching my major to business. The one thing that I said. You know, I wasn't going to do, you, you know, it wasn't like switching. Yeah, it was like general business. And I was doing so to support, you know, an internship, you know what I mean, at Target. So I, I worked at Kmart all throughout high school while playing sports. So it was like I left Kmart. Kmart like I was, yeah. So I was done with retail and here I am back in retail and building my, you know, education, you know, foundation to support this retail career. So that, uh... That was a sad, sad times. You know, of course, I was excited about the internship, but I, I really leveraged that internship to help inspir inspire me and uplift me. But in reality, it was, it was a sad time. Who did you tell first that you were nervous about telling? Who was the first person you told where, you, where during this time of failure, where you were feeling down? It was probably my mom you know my grandmas my grandmothers they they had no idea and, and mind you you know this was more so internal right uh, self-reflection because in reality my mom was just happy that i was you know at college and, and holding it down but my mom you know telling her was like um uh, switching you know because i hadn't you know she always tells the story like i was the one kid you know that never really needed direction or needed oh. like do your homework or needed like I feel that you know to soul. go to go to you know class where you know she kind of had to do that after me my siblings like what what do you mean I have to the teachers calling me like she never had to do that so to you know you know A's B's all those things managed everything really you know never got in real trouble you know to her knowledge but it's just like um all of those things you know what I mean so it was like damn like what do you mean it's not is kicking your ass or is you switching your major, et cetera. So I put a positive spin on it with the Target internship, but the the fear of coming out and saying it was, uh, was hard. Do you ever feel like, going back to something you said, because I, I relate to that so hardcore. When my mom describes like her three kids, she's always like, well, you never needed, you know, me to wake you up for school or me to make you breakfast or me to tell you to do your homework or to tell you to do a project. Do you ever feel like in a way you did need them to show up in a different way? You kind of got shorted in a way just because you didn't need that guy. Yeah, I do. I mean, yeah, I think for me, you know, I won't say like it's being a man and all those things. I think for me, it the short didn't come in, in kind of those ways. The short came in lack of knowledge, right? So I would have loved, you know, part of the reason we wrote the book, I would have loved to been coached on how to manage things better or finances or managing emotions. I think some of those things if we're gonna get really deep, trickle over into me being an independent male, even in my, you know, marriage, you know what I mean? Like I really mm -hmm. I'm pretty self-sustaining. I have friends that are like, oh my wife does all the cooking, etc. But I, I I value those things, but I carry this hey, I don't really need any of that. I'm pretty self-sustaining. So I feel like 
that's always been who I am and that contributes to things but to say oh I, I would have been an engineer if my mom would have checked in on me more I can't I can't say that I think it's more of the lack of you know my mom had me as a high school you know senior very very young so we grew up and shit we were learning together you know what I mean so mm -hmm. uh, yeah no that's that's very different I, I can't relate to that part of it because that's that's a whole life experience right there and it's really the foundation of what we built mm -hmm. this of what the first book is built on but I just always felt like when my mom would say that, I would never say anything, but internally I would feel some type of way because I'd be like, yeah, but it was because it put, it was me being seven years old, not knowing how to do this project and just figuring it, there was a lot of pressure and speaking to, it's good in a way that I'm an adult and I can handle a lot of pressure. It's bad in a way, speaking to what you just said that I'm incredibly self-sufficient. So it's really hard for me to be vulnerable and ask for help or allow people to help me because I'm in my mind, I'm like, I know I need help. I have way too much on my plate, but I would just rather do it myself. Spot on. Spot on. Yeah. And that well leads said. to you putting way too much on your plate and not asking for help. And it's just a repetitive issue in my life. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, it's funny if any of my fraternity brothers see this, they'll, they'll probably like disagree with this wholeheartedly because I've grown the brand of being like a delegator. <laughs> Like, oh, you're the ultimate really? delegate. And I think it's, yeah, and I think it's in response of everything you just articulated somewhere along the lines in, in college, you know, I just learned that you know, it takes a village and sometimes that can come off as like delegation, but I just call it being a leader and being a smart, a smart leader. So I think that but shows like, in my career and my life. But AD, there's a difference between delegating a project and like in your marriage, delegating yeah, yeah, like yeah, 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 household, yeah. like communication things like like I, I work 60 to 70 hours a week we have two kids and then like I manage our household but for the life of me I won't have my husband sit there and meet with the painters like why can't I do that <laughs> like why can't I let him do that yeah so that I, I mean, think that's important to speak to people who grew up like that who were the independent ones out of their household to, to work on that aspect because it does make personal relationships and important ones like marriages more difficult if you can't master one communication and two which you seem to be strong at is delegation yeah yeah and, and delegation I would add delegation um, as a response to knowing your pain points and knowing what you're not strong at right so there's no way like I'm taking the lead on the interior designing or the painting or things of that nature for a number of reasons, right? So I supplement those things, but I'm not the point person. So I think the delegation comes from, hey, like I'm not the best at doing this. Um, so let's partner. Yeah, well, you're also with a create, you're married to a creative woman. So that's- Yeah, exactly, that helps. <laughs> that's helpful. Looking back now, would you have handled that situation? Because it seems like you handled it with grace, but looking back now, would you have handled that situation differently? How can someone in that position learn from what you went through, failing with a major and, and switching? What year did you fail? What year is that? That was, I graduated in 2008. I switched my major between, um, actually I started, you know, when did I, graduate? I started in 2008, so I switched my major 2009, graduated in 2012. So, so were you a, a sophomore? Yeah, 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 yeah. I finished a year, so I was a sophomore. It was the sophomore summer. Did you lose any credits? I had to take summer classes for the rest of my time there. So I don't, I don't know if I lost credits, but some of them did transfer over. So it was a, it wasn't a, it wasn't a pickup for sure. So I had to take some, take some extra classes over the summer. So you graduated in about. Yeah, yeah, still got it in. Still okay. got out in four, four in the four in the summer. And the additional summer was more so like trying to get an extra grant, you know, keep the bills paid. Four point two five. Exactly. Okay, touch on that, the grant process. Yeah. I didn't so have grant, to do that. Yeah, grant process was, every day was a learning opportunity for me in college, so the first generation. I think that the story here is, 
about not having the knowledge, right? So you asked one question. So let me touch on that. And that was lessons learned. The lesson learned, it, it starts at the source. And that is take control of your future, right? Even as you get advice, perspective, here's what you should study. We live in a world, a digital world, where you can legitimately Google everything. And I found this out as a junior when I just Googled and just to see what, how I could apply my business degree and found out about healthcare and lo and behold, here I am. But that can be done while you're junior in high school. So really take time to do research every night, et cetera. Um, so I think that's, that's the most important lesson learned. And I think that also applies to financial aid and grant writing. And tell my siblings as they have went to college and some of them continue to think about college. There is a grant, a scholarship or something for everyone. And you everything. Yeah, everything, everyone, etc. So for me, I like, I got some of the things like $2,500 Pell Grant. I took out a lot of um, loans, the right loans, because of, again, I was going to office hours and I was also going to see my financial aid aunties. So... <laughs> Caressa, Colette, which they had a lot of nephews, a lot of kids. They got pictures in their office, etc. Again, you're going to make me call them after this, but um, they looked out for a lot Should. of people. Um, and just more so with information and resources. I spent a lot of time in their office, and I'll tell you that they're the reason why I, you know, I didn't leave. Because I remember calling my mom, like, it's not looking too hot. And going down to see the financial aid office and getting some loans of course some of those you know loans still paying back today but they kept they kept the ship sailing supplementing those loans with pale grants and first generation grants and things that you just don't get automatically you only get by asking questions being aware so doing your research building strong relationships because every especially every minority doesn't have a, a auntie and a, a grandma in the uh, office and i say that jokingly because they're not really my blood family but over the years they looked out heavy. Um, so that, that helped a lot. It's so important to build those relationships because you do not know. I mean, my one of my biggest pet peeves is when people would say, you're too friendly. I'm like, me being too friendly is what's gonna, has yeah. gotten me into so many doors that were closed. Mm -hmm. Me being too friendly has gotten me into conversations with people you'll never speak to. Mm -hmm. Be too friendly. Be too friendly. And anyone who says you're too friendly is never going to be successful as an entrepreneur in a, in a corporate setting. I don't care what, if, if they're working at PetSmart, you will never win at anything if you are closed off, resting bitch face, not open to communication. Um, so that's crucial. You're saying that those relationships that you built over time is what kept you there. Easily, easily. I remember, um, you know, freshman, after my freshman year. So the summer after my freshman year, I moved in with uh, a friend of mine who was doing extremely well. Shout out to, I call him, we call him Squirrel, but shout out to Darius. He's a successful master electrician down in St. Pete. We moved in, I moved in with him for the summer. He was, um, you know, doing his thing in the back of the house at Logan's Road House. Are we allowed home. to know why he's called Squirrel? Uh, I was just like a nickname growing up. I wish I knew a real reason. Probably because he looked like a squirrel. Is he uh, the reason we use a squirrel? No, no, no. Okay. No. <laughs> just Yeah. A squirrel is a familiar <laughs> it's a familiar <laughs> animal and it's one that you see everywhere. So it was more for what's well, gonna remind folks of man's all the time. So it's a long story there. But so he's doing the thing. We moved in together. I started working at Logan's World House, busting tables and working as a host. And that summer was when I got a um, additional loan. I never forget the amount of was seventeen fifty, and I got a two thousand dollar Pell Grant, and that allowed me to like get a rental car. I remember get like a little silver. I don't remember the brand, but like a little silver Nissan rental car. I was able to get to and from work. So that was the deal. I would get us to and from work, and he would. Um, you know what I'm saying? Take care of meals with food stamps and give me a couch. So combination of good relationships and my friends in the financial aid office kept, kept the shit going. Do you feel like it would have been helpful to learn those processes in high school? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. In some structured form. And I mind you, I'm not going to sit up here and say that, you know, those things weren't available. Like I was I was playing sports and I was like working, right? So I know they have a lot of transition transition like coursework for high school students. You probably can tell me mm-hmm. more better if those exist, but to have them built in, just like you have science built in, which I know sounds like Florida's trying to build in some of those financial things in there. I'm hoping that college grants and how to apply for funding is in there. So um just my oh, I hope so. Yeah, just my ignorance, but I'm sure uh, those things exist. But back to that original point. Do your research, ask around, go see your guidance counselor, do whatever you gotta do, because it won't free money is not gonna always come find you. When you were in high school, because you had a different experience than I did. Did you feel like you're, you had a relationship with your guidance counselor and they had that knowledge to give to you? Because I didn't, I don't even know who my guidance counselor was in high school. No, no, not for, no, no, no way, no way, Jose. If I did, I would have probably, um, I would have probably applied to way more schools than just one. <laughs> I only applied to one, one as well, but yeah. I feel like resources, those resources should have been advertised like, hey, are your parents going to pay for college or are they not? If they're not, come. you need to be here after school every yeah. Friday to learn about this process. I think that's huge. And if there's any parents watching this and they know that they're not going to be able to provide 100% for the, or maybe you are and you just want your kids to be responsible and learn about this process and support themselves so they can appreciate what you've saved for them, it's worth sitting down and having that conversation on how to do these things. I mean, I have clients that have more than enough money to send their kids to college and they choose to make them pay for it. And I am all for that. So how AJ and I have decided to handle college with our kids is that we've fully funded their college accounts. Uh, They're they're, both of our kids have, we're blessed to say that their, their college is fully funded for if they decide to go that route but we will make them take out student loans. And then we will tell them if they pay, if they show up to class and they can pass with at least a C average and a major that we approve of, then we will help, we will pay off those loans and therefore improve their credit at the end of their college career. And it also gives us an extra three to four years for that money to compound. And whenever they don't use, we get to, they get to either use towards a wedding or a down payment on their first home whichever they see fit. I think it is important as someone whose college was fully funded and who did not appreciate that until I got there. And I saw people around me struggling to pay for the experience that I was totally taking advantage of. So I think that that's something to think about if you have kids and to also educate them on on what AG, it seems like you just kind of had to learn, figure it out once you got there. Life is the best teacher. No, I mean, you're preaching. I have to say it's a blessing, but you know, you live and learn. And I think it's our goal, whether you be first generation or not, is to make sure you package up those learnings and pass them, pass them on down the line. So I think you, even you just talking through that is going to be beneficial to me hearing it and it's going to be beneficial to others. What is your view on college for your future children? Um, I think college is college is, is, is amazing. I think continued education is good. You know, I'm not I'm not sold on that being the only route. Um, you know, I've seen enough stories of geniuses and entrepreneurs probably more now than ever. So it's just one of those things where I know how important it is to be interested in something. So my goal when I get to that point, the father is going to be to expose them to as many things as I can. And, you know, let them choose, but I'm, I'm pushing towards college. I'm, you know, I'm leaning towards the HBCU route, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm flexible. So we'll uh, cross that bridge as we get closer to it. The more, the more I see, I, I really would love for my kids to go through college, obviously educate them on how to run a business, how to be an entrepreneur, how to responsibly handle finances, how to evaluate companies, how to build a company, and then have them work at one of mine for maybe three to five years after high school and then go to college if they want to. They'll have the choice. But to me, I think that if I had gone to college with a more mature mindset, I would have gotten more out of it. 
because I'll tell you one thing, most of college, at least an undergraduate degree, I think I, I don't think anyone checked my transcripts at all. I think I used maybe 10% of what I learned in real life. And I had double majored in something that's directly applicable two things that are directly applicable to my job. And I mean, I think I just partied for three and a half years. So, I mean, it's great and all, but was it worth it? Probably not. Wish I would have gone when I was like in my mid twenties. How has your failure, which honestly, it doesn't even feel like the way you're describing it. It just seems like you rolled right through it. Like how, I mean, no, you were no. sad, but like, why yeah. was it a failure? Like, because you were sad? It was a failure, I think, based on the, you know, being intentional and wanting to achieve one goal. And it was also a failure because of the sheer uncertainty. Like, I'm telling the story now, you know, 10, 12 years earlier, but I'll never forget. First off, going and meeting with, you know, random, you know, you know, you know, white guy that I've never met and asking and begging to get into the College of Business and being told that it was impossible, begging more and, you know, talking through it and seeing like, hey, you have one shot, writing letters, etc. cetera. Um, and then coming back to that point with the sweat and the, the tension of not knowing if you were going to pass managerial accounting. So it was a it wasn't a, you know, I'm smiling about it now, but I vividly remember the uncertainty because it was, it was make or break. I was done with engineering school. I had one other shot. You know, I already told myself I wasn't going to do, you know, some random major. So it was like, if I can't do business to support this target internship, then this is it. Like, you know, why here? Second round. Yeah. So you had to be a business major to, to get the target internship. It was, it just made sense, right? So I told them during the interview process that I was actively transitioning to business. Okay, so you yeah. had it to get... <laughs> So it was make or break. It was make or break. You know what I mean? It was make okay, or break. Because that... they were looking for interns, but they were looking for folks that could be, we call them LODs, leader of stores, after the internship. So clearly I'm in healthcare, so that's a whole other story in itself. It wasn't the route for me, but it was a... Uh, there's a lot going on at that time. So bring me to that moment, because I was just kind of like going through our conversation in my head. I was like, did he tell us how he ended up in healthcare? Because that's like a, not the same thing at all. How did you get yeah. to healthcare? Yeah, so that um, 2009 is, you know, later part of 2009 is when I was. So I love that to... you have dates for everything. <laughs> yeah, it was the same year. You, you started it. You started it. Like, what year was that? So I'm just uh, playing it back now because I also started, um, you know, learning more about fraternity and um, learning more about Alpha Phi Alpha, which I ended up joining in 2010. So it was a lot going on at that time. So I, I remember having to open up a store at like 5 a.m., getting there like legitimately being pulled, I don't think I've ever told anybody this, being pulled into the HR office. And it was like two, you know, we had the two in the, two in the room. So it was a woman, HR director, and then like a male. So, you know, they're there to like give me some bad news. And like, they were legit like, it's not gonna work out. You know, you weren't here to open the store at five. You got here at six and you got here and you left early. I can't even vividly, I can't even tell you what I said to get out of that. I know it was some crying. I know it was some tears. I know it was some some genuine storytelling, but ended up finishing the internship. So that's the blessing. But that could have easily been a failure. And I don't know where we would be if that would happen. But anyway, I finished the internship and then I became a counselor. So I don't know if you remember like CARE, the CARE program at Florida State. It's like a summer bridge program. I remember it. Yeah, I was a CARE counselor and I was like, I can't go back to retail. So that's when I start pouring into research. How can I apply my business degree? And I remember- Remind me list. what CARE was, because that's going to bother me. It's a summer bridge program. So Center for Academic Retention and Enhancement. It's like a summer bridge program to get like inner city, smart, but single family home, underrepresented students into Florida State. And has produced like a lot of, super successful people like um, the guy who produced Moonlight, who's also an alpha and just a host of other people that, you know, have done successful things. But anyway, 
that program, I came through it and then a few years later came back to be a counselor. Poured into myself, studied, found out about healthcare administration, again, relationships, used, um, who is now like an advisor of Alpha Phi Alpha, introduced me to the Thagger Health Center. I don't know if you remember the health center on campus, Thagger. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. So uh, Leslie Satcher, who was the director of Thagger at the time, let me intern with her so it was like a work study job but internship so she was That's like teaching internship. me about teaching me about healthcare and like hey she drew a circle and said healthcare is a business and it does all these things and like at the time I felt like I was wearing like a shirt and tie to work and working in a local compliance office and I said I really I really fuck with this I really like this and that's what um sparked the interest because I knew I didn't want to just graduate and take a you know 40k paying job I was like ah. There's something more out there. So I ended up going to um, graduate school to get my master's right after that internship, right after graduating. So that's how I stumbled and failed my way into healthcare. It's okay. Did you do your graduate at Florida State as well? University of Central Florida. So I moved to Orlando. I wanted to be yeah. close to home, which is St. Pete, Florida, but not too close to home. So that was like, it was either Orlando's USF perfect. or UCF. Yeah. Just, yeah, just so far that's enough. A l- you have subs a little too close. Exactly. Just a little bit too close because exactly. I grew up where you grew up. Um, yeah, I think UCF's a great. I didn't realize that that's what well, makes sense because that's where you were, Orlando, mm-hmm. when we really started getting going. Um, okay, so you that's when you made the decision to healthcare. Do you still feel? Obviously, you're working there now, so I feel like this is a loaded question. But do you still feel? that passionate about where you're at? Yeah, absolutely. So, I, you know, I did graduate school in Orlando, then I moved to Pennsylvania to work in healthcare. And there is where I really, like, fell in love with not the industry, but, you know, I really, really found the alignment between health and community. So much so that I built, like, a co-founded a platform dedicated to, like, career development for those coming up in healthcare and around healthcare. Um, and community impact. So an organization that really dives into those two things to figure out creative ways to tackle, we call them social determinants of health. So access to healthy food, mental health, housing initiatives. So every year we do a summit where we bring together hundreds of healthcare leaders and we really get into the nitty gritty talking about these issues, but also um, challenging ourselves to do something about them. So it's, uh, it's a part of who I am now, not only the day job, um, but also to your point, kind of on the weekends. What is that program called? It is the Advancement League. The Advancement League. We you did come a, into Zoom. You yeah, did come into Zoom and that change. was your name. I, and I was like, this motherfucker name. sounds like an Avenger. Like, <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, that's what we're doing. We're Avenging <laughs> Communities and Careers. We need to get oh, you I to see what you about, did there. We need to come get you to talk about... Um, advancing lives and communities but we need to come get you to talk about financial literacy i think um oh i would love that love that august love august and rally durham august and rally durham because there's so I, so much alignment i have nine clients there so i am there actually quite often that's there it is get you there we'll see you the link to register right after this we're gonna hold you accountable no, I will. I will do that. I, I promise. My goal going into 2022 is more speaking engagements because, as my practice grows, and I've talked about this on other episodes, and it's the reason why I started making myself do this podcast every week. Is so much more of my job is about business administration and scaling, which is great. Some people love that shit, but when I do, because I'm one person, when I do more of that, it takes away from actually talking to people and the biggest impact I make in my job is having those really in-depth to the core heartfelt sometimes emotional conversations with just people like that's how I feel like I make the most impact on people's lives and um, so that's why I wanted to get more into that here's why I started this podcast Um, so yeah definitely passionate about that but getting back let me let me let me tell you what I'm going to talk about real quick So we're going to talk about financial literacy, right? So as healthcare leaders, how do you invest in yourself? But even more than that, right? How do we strategically invest in health and community? So you talked about evaluating companies. I think we're in the industry, we're working in the industry, but we don't see 
the scheme of the lens that you see these things in, and that is the business of healthcare behind the scenes. So we'll talk more about that later. Well, it's I want to put a little little juice into that. Um, are you referencing to the workers themselves or how the industry connects to the community that's not currently employed by your industry? Like, are we talking about benefits for underprivileged employees that are coming up, ben- education on those benefits? Or are you talking about free resources for people that need them or both? Three part, three part. So one is the leader themselves. So for me, it's beneficial for me to know how to invest in the industry that I live and work in. So mm-hmm. I will tell you that there's plenty of folks in, in my position or hired that, you know, didn't see Pfizer in the rise or, you know, I think the stock is still going up since 2020, you know what I mean? Or mm-hmm. Abbott Labs and just how to be able to see these trends and, you know, you know, monetize for them to be able to put food on their family's table. The other piece of it is financial literacy as a social determinant of health. So the communities at large, when you really scale it back, is where they live, it's access to food and all those things, but it's also lack of resources. So how do you, as a leader, how do you prioritize that for the hospital that you're leading? Or you have the ear of the CEO, how do you start to make that a part of who you are, how you approach problems? So I think it's multifaceted conversation can go one or two ways but i think it's to benefit the individual and their development from a financial literacy standpoint and their ability to deliver that as a leader and just be conscious of it as we make decisions for our hospitals and our communities for sure and i think it's incredibly challenging and this is a touchy subject so i'm almost like hesitant to even bring it up but it's how do you have so many it's cool now to talk about these things in big companies right it's cool to talk about these sensitive topics it makes it interesting or to have a project or a team that's devoted to you know integrating these issues into the core of a business structure to make it seem like big companies care about this shit to sum it all up but how do you make those more than just a newsletter that goes out to employees every month. Like, how do you make it a really impactful program and not something that a company is putting in a Forbes article saying, yeah, we care, we have this program, we put $50,000 a year towards it. That's what I see, especially when I'm evaluating companies like Pfizer, like, do I want to invest in this? Are they really investing in things that they care about or are they just doing it to say that they're doing it? that's a big who's, deal. I'm not saying your program is one of those programs, no, but seriously. that's what's who's, important to me. Who's really, what companies, you know, ESG, what companies are truly doing good for the community? And how do we make sure yes. that those companies are on the radar? Because we built the Advanced Money Platform on community. So I think another layer of it is the expertise that you bring. So you heard it here first. We'll see Kendall and yeah. Rally Durham. For sure. Because the biggest... You know, there's always the the board of directors and they're like we're we're so diverse and they add like the one black chick to the board of directors like what is she supposed to like that's way yeah. too much pressure yeah like that's that's my biggest pet peeve but i think it's awesome that you are bringing that program i did not even realize how involved you were with that program so that's shame on me but mm-hmm. getting back to the itinerary how was your failure in the engineering sector so pretty early on in your college career so I thought you were going to say like junior which would have been oh, you would have lost so many credits but how did that experience make you better in your career today or maybe even bring it back to as a student how did that make you better and set you up for the success that you're experiencing now Yes, I think it it forced me moving forward to always ask the question, regardless of how it sounds, what's in it for me? And by that, I mean, one, do I truly care about this thing? And if I don't, is there an opportunity to dig into it a little bit more, peel back the onion and find the alignment? So, you know, jumping into business, you know, outside of managerial accounting, you know, you know, business principles and the finance portion, et cetera, as we dove into examples. I had to always ask myself in my coursework, one, am I working hard enough? Two, 
can I connect the dots? Because for engineering, I couldn't connect the dots. It was a dream that was pushed upon me and the, the, the trophy was this pot of money that I knew engineers got, which I didn't even know the dollar amount. I never thought to Google, what do engineers make after you know undergrad? So for me, it forced me to ask what's in it for me and put accountability on me to always do research and pressure test after everything. I think those principles are things that have Ooh, I like that carried, pressure test. carried me, yeah, carried me through life and even support me now as a leader of people. How did it make you a better leader in your job today? Like, how did you, when you see someone struggling in their role, maybe someone that reports to you or reports to someone that reports to you, do you actively go out and address those individuals or do you leave that to someone else? Is that someone else's job? Do you yeah, recognize pretty, other struggles? Yeah, I think I think from an awareness standpoint, one is, you know, maybe more empathetic, but more aware of when something isn't the right fit for someone. Right. So coming in, new leader, folks have been in a leadership role for one year or 20 years. I can tell, you know, if the excitement, the passion, the interest is still there. Um, and I think that comes from living it you know, early on as a student, taking a few jobs you know, during grad school that didn't speak to my soul and, and it showed in, in, in one way or another. So those are things that stick out to me as well. Um, so it helps me adjust and figure out if there's a different fit for those individuals um, or or to you know push me to have other conversations. But that empathy, empathy and awareness Huge. has remained with me. Yeah. Especially when you get to a point, and I don't know if you've had to do this yet, but when you have to let someone go, yeah, that is yeah. by far, have you had to do that yet? Yeah, multiple, multiple, countless. I've only had to do it one time and it is so hard yeah, like it's, it's probably my least favorite thing to do but I will say when I had to do that it brought up so many feel so I've had more than one failure I will have episodes on those but when I had to go to do that so much guilt and, tra and just PTSD from those personal failures came up through that experience because of what you said you, you got to be empathetic but you don't want to do project what happened to you onto these people. How did your experience with failure in general, not even necessarily this failure, how did you utilize that the first time you had to let someone go in a leadership role? I think, you know, you touched on the word and you are reading that word is, is empathy, right? I think for me, you know, as I reflect on the first time I had to let someone go, it was, hey, like I've, I've been here, I've been there, this is unfortunate, but it was almost a, a inspirational, motivational talk. You know, I remember the conversation came up. Spun and, into, listen, you're fired. Yeah, <laughs> this individual, which I led with that, I led with, hey, we're going to move on, but it led to, hey, now this is going to give me an opportunity to take care of my health and pour into this business idea that I had, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a uplifting conversation um, towards the end. Now, all of them have been like that. That first one, since that's the one you asked about, was an opportunity to be empathetic and just remind folks that this is a, a block in the road, but it's one that could really propel something else. Bigger I'm glad you better. handled yours with grace because mine was a fucking disaster. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for joining me tonight. What is the best way for people to contact you? The most comfortable way for you to be contacted if people want to. Yeah. Contact. So um, LinkedIn, active on LinkedIn, heavily with this summit coming up in August, Antoine D. Dot Williams or um, Instagram. And that A is an apple, D is in dark, Williams, I, I. So A, D, Williams. Second. And we'll tag you. We will definitely tag you on here. Also, I will tag our books, Instagram, just to remind you guys to go get that workbook, get that book, and then soon get that second book. We are planning on a three book series. That's still the goal, right? Yeah, three book, three and workbook. Then, so six, six pieces. And then also some uh, conventional educational tools to go with that. More to come. Thanks again. I really appreciate you. 
And this is another episode of Failure Friday. Thank you so much for joining us. I will tag all of AD's information slash Antoine's information in the (laughs) summary if you want to get connected with him. And then, of course, you can always DM me if you have any questions. Good night. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.